share screen. There we go, share. Oh, now, now it's starting, yeah. Grandi. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, okay. So it, uh, on September 3rd, which is our next meeting, we have an incredible artist who, uh, he's a Fulbright winner, a teacher at uh, George Mason. Uh, I visited his studio actually, let me think, last weekend? Um, oh. Yeah, last weekend, just to see his work in person. Uh, really incredible work, uh, incredible painter. Um, I think we hired him for a, to jury the member show, I, I believe. Uh, for Yellow Barn. I can't remember if it was member show of or if it was high school exhibition, but he, he was a great judge, incredible speaker, very vivacious, has a lot, a lot of energy, and definitely a lot of opinions on art and the world as it is. Uh, so I really recommend and stress letting people know, letting your friends know uh, uh, about our artist interview next weekend, or sorry, two weeks on September 3rd. Uh, I also want to let you guys know that uh, on my webpage now has uh, on the ACO page, which is one of the tabs on the side, has a link to all of the artist interviews that we've done to this date. It'll link you to YouTube, so it's just like a, a nice link, but it, it's a little bit more organized than YouTube will do it for you. Um, we don't have call-ins because I still need to steal that from Mariana uh, listed, but everything else is up there uh, and organized by date and time. So it should be really easy to kind of go back in time and uh, see what we've been doing and, and see some of the recordings we have uh, to, uh, at this point. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. So Thank you so much, that's great. Uh, and I'm, I've, I'll send you the poster, Mariana, and hopefully our members can kind of sh maybe share the poster to their uh, friends and followers. Just, you know, these are free events that we're, we're, we're uh, yeah. giving to the uh, DC Eric uh, community, so I, I I'd like to get as many people involved just to support the artists who are spending their time uh, talking yes. about their work for us. So it's, it's yeah, nice that we can do that. it's really nice. And we will, we are prepare, preparing to apply for a grant, but we need everyone's help if, uh, because we are paying the artists for their time. It's a, almost a nominal fee, I would say, but, um, Honestly, but it's, uh, the more yeah. people who attend, I think it's easier for us to just, or, for them to justify giving us money to continue this project that we right so on. what we need your help with is both attendance and if you want to donate something but attendance is probably the number yep. one Absolutely. and spread the word because we now have spread it to um the goings on for the park every couple of weeks there we're included uh, the aco is included um, and they publish it every couple of weeks um, as an email that goes, I think, to 19,000 people. And, um, and also, think, thankfully, Lenny Campella also puts it on his uh, web, on his blog, uh, blog, not yeah. blog, it's uh, not could a video. You, Jordan, could, you share, you, could you share a link with Jordan, me so that I could uh, pass it around to my gallery members? Oh, yeah, nice. absolutely. Yeah, the, nice. The, the best link is the uh, tab on the uh, on the ACO webpage, which is my webpage and then the tab there. Uh, but I'll send that to you directly, Grace. Thank you. But and do you do PayPal, Venmo, or Zelle? Uh, Venmo and Zelle work. My email uh, or um, my my tag for Venmo is uh, J Jordan Bruns. Um, but J J Jordan Bruns. Yep, J Jordan Bruns for okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, but without further ado, we can get started. Yeah. Paper. Thank, you. thank you, guys. And I want to thank uh, Lisa in particular, because she she came up with a topic and everybody concurred with her in our classes that this would be a nice topic. So it's meant to be uh, very uh, participatory. So feel free to interrupt us. And I put together a little um, outline in a way of some things and I learned some things that I wanted to share with you guys and Jordan did too. Um, so we'll divide it. I'm going to start uh, briefly and um, so we're going to talk about drawing papers, printing papers, and I put it in parentheses or separately because I think we could do another session if people are ever interested in this. Um, so I, that's why I put it in parentheses. We'll mention them, but we're not going to go in deeply into it. Watercolor and water media, I'm quite familiar with that. And, and we have many of you who also know about that. So jump in when you want to. And of course, mixed media and oil papers, which are kind of new on the scene relatively new on the scene. So I put in some new 
some information that was sort of new to me about how they're made and uh, and also how to make uh, any other papers archival for our purposes. More and more um, artists are using paper now, I notice, even oil artists, because it's easier to transport to workshops, to, um, to classes, and they can be more easily mounted with the new kind of uh, acrylic media and acrylic uh, glues, um, and can be mounted onto panels or onto backing boards to make them stiffer and more frameable. So uh, paper making originated in China in the second century. By the way, JM, uh, as you know, Jackson's Art, which is a UK vendor of art, has fabulous articles. And I had intermittently looked at it before, but it, it has really in-depth articles about all kinds of things. Um, the main, so this one, I, I got it from them. The main constituent of the stock of paper is pulp, uh, which is a fibrous material made by either beating rags, wood, or plant matter to extract the cellulose fibers, which are long and thin, um, to make the key component of paper. Now you can mix rags, wood, and plant matter. If using wood, soft woods in the United States, Bruce and pine in particular are preferred because of their elastic fibers and processing includes a whole processing series of chipping into pulp, washing, bleaching, refining, beading, sizing, coloring the fibers to make everything happen. Next slide. And this is just a visual to show you how it starts from, I can't use a pointer because I'm on an iPad, but starting at the pines on the left and then going around on the onto the right and this cycle regenerates because luckily for us we can recycle paper. Thank you, Jordan. And we um, and you see how newsprint is sort of one of the first um, results of this cycle. And then the pipe paper is the actual recycle into more paper and then bleached and so on. So um, thank you. I, this I found very interesting. On the left is a schema for the weight in pounds. You know, we'd say 90 pounds, 100, 140 pounds for watercolor paper, 300 pounds. What does that mean? Well, the, the convention is, and I'm staying on the left, is the, the weight in pounds of 500 sheets. However, the sheets can be different sizes. So as you can imagine, 500 sheets of one paper can weigh the same as another paper, but if the other paper is larger, uh, you're not really comparing the same exact unit. So you're comparing apples and oranges. So this, the pounds is a very, uh, is a approximation that can have a lot of variance. Then the other term is weight in grams per meter square, and that is more accurate. And so that is one square meter of any su paper substance. So we're comparing apples to apples here. So the more accurate representation of the weight of the paper is really the GSM, which is grams per square meter. So I thought, by the way, I'm happy to post this somewhere so you can keep it, because I thought some of these charts were useful to me. So the 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 average weight of different, both in pounds and in grams of watercolor, of drawing, of sketch, Bristol charcoal. And I'm sure you can find other charts for other papers, but they give you the approximation. But as you can see, the weight in pounds and weight in grams doesn't correspond linearly from one paper to the other, because remember that's an inaccurate um, approximation of the weight. So if we can get used to saying, you know, 300 gram watercolor paper is 140 pounds, I, I'm used to pounds, <laughs> but it, the more accurate is weighting grams, uh, grams per square meter. Okay, so this is more for reference, and this is definitely for reference. Um, they're the British and UK and European way of assigning uh, a name to the size of a unit, and you may never come across this, but the other day I was trying to print something and it asked me only in A, A0 to A5, what did I want to print it at? So I had to look it up. <laughs> I did not know. So on the right, you have the representation in, in centimeters. So it's a 
that's the unit. So next slide, if Jordan can. Uh, oh, and that. Jordan is going to show you. Show oh, us I thought something. I had this up my, uh, um, from Japan. I thought I had, uh, because they do the same system. I they have a, for at least panels and, and canvases, they have it for F. So I think paper may be A, and then the other letters of the alphabet will be like F and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think I covered up all mine with just so. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I was wondering if that's the reason why, because I, I ran into this and I was like, well, I don't understand this new system. Can you just give me dimensions? Yeah. And, um, but I guess it, other countries know this by heart. But um, yeah, anyway. Yes. Yeah, I noticed in UK, they always talk about, oh, I did it in A3. And I go, what? What is that? <laughs> so yeah. there, there's your reference table. So drawing papers, I'm going to um, pass it on to Jordan because he's going to talk about this if he wants. Yeah, well, at least some of them. I, I'm, some of these I have, actually haven't really used uh, very often uh, in, in art making. Uh, but newsprint is kind of the, the uh, I'd say the more I'm practicing because it's not archival, I'm going to throw this away at the end of class. Um, and it's a great warm up paper. Uh, it's smooth, it holds charcoal very well. Um, it's easy to kind of take a, a paper towel and erase it down to at least comparable to where you started. Uh, so it's to me, I use it as a chalkboard paper and eventually it gets to a point where it's just unusable and then you just flip it over and start again. Uh, but for mm -hmm. practice, I think it's a great paper. Uh, the only problem with newsprint paper is when you do make that really amazing uh, drawing <laughs> and you say, oh my gosh, I wish this was, was on better paper. It takes a little bit of like, I guess, mental preparedness to say, it's not on better paper. I just have to move on. <laughs> I think we've all run into that situation where newsprint, um, you know, you've done this amazing drawing in class or of a model or, or whatever on newsprint, and then you just, you have to let it go and, and that's it. Um, I haven't worked too much on sulfite, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I I have, Jordan, um, the, the paper that we use for um, gelatin printing is sulfide paper. And it's the heavy drawing, a heavy weight um, construction paper that's acid free by PACON, P-A-C-O-N, and Plaza sells it. But what's nice about sulfide paper is you can color it very nicely with, um, with like acrylics, for example, and use it for, um, for um, uh, collage. And, uh, and it's an okay for sketching and making, yeah. And uh, among other uses for like collage or construction of things that you want to be acid free. Yeah, uh, in terms of drawing paper, we'll show you in the next slide a bunch of different types of drawing paper, at least in pads. Um, in, uh, in general, like the higher the weight, uh, the more expensive it's gonna be and the more durable it's gonna be for whatever, for whatever your drawing uh, purposes are. If you're just using like a pencil and you're just sketching and you know, if it turns out great, awesome. If not, not a big deal. You know, lower weight papers is gonna be fine for that matter. Um, my preference for drawing paper is always heavy weight. So if you can afford it, or if you, especially in a sketchbook, um, I, I definitely think the higher the weight, the better. Um, but if it's just yeah. kind of like to doodle by the phone or whatever, a low weight is mm -hmm. not going to be a, a, a big, uh, it's not going to make a big difference there. Um, mm -hmm. I do think when you move into some, you know, more classroom settings where you are, where the, where the goal is to make a nice drawing and you are working in charcoal, uh, switching to a, a paper that has a nice tooth to it, uh, you know, these longer 20 minute poses in, in, a, in a situation with a model, for instance, uh, using that charcoal paper that has a nice tooth to it that is maybe pastel colored or whatever it may be uh, is worth doing. I would say there are a lot of papers out there that have a texture that is maybe not desirable. I think we, we purchased a paper for uh, the studio that has kind of like a lot of horizontal lines that I think were completely unnecessary. And then a lot of the drawings that I've created, they, they almost became a distraction from the actual uh, art that I was actually making. So if you are buying charcoal paper by the sheet, and I, I, I put charcoal in there in specific for this reason, because they do aim for a texture, um, make sure that you are okay with the grid format or the stripe format, because everyone tries to be creative with the texture on the paper. So just be aware of that. Um, for pastel paper, I think it's a little bit less likely to have that patterned in the, in the texture. 
I do like the uh, Kansas and Mistons paper because you can get almost any color in the spectrum and it has a decent texture uh, that you can use for pastel, for Conte Grand, for charcoal. Um, so I, I think it's a kind of a, a, it's a low weight kind of paper. I, you might be able to get a, a heavier texture, but I, I'm pretty used to their basic paper um, by now. But I really like the ability to have a variety of different colors at your disposal with, the, with that Kansan uh, paper for uh, pastel. And it's nice that you can use it for a lot of different uh, uh, mediums as well. For, for Bristol, I think it's, it's my experience with Bristol paper is, is mostly with pencil and graphite. It's a little mm -hmm. too smooth for mediums like charcoal. Um, if you like a smooth surface for your drawings, it, it'll hold uh, Conte crayon, uh, marker even uh, pretty well. It, it, the the penetration of like inks and, and things uh, is is okay for uh, vellum at least and Bristol and vellum are very similar, uh, but it's just a thicker kind of cardstock paper that is very smooth. Uh, some people like it, some people don't enjoy working on textured paper. Uh, other people, uh, you know, it is what it is. It's whatever you feel best. Um, and then Maria put in a, this kind of a, a nice special category. Uh, that kind of can do a lot of different things for drawing, wet, wet application, and so forth. Uh, the one I am most familiar with is definitely going to be Arches BFK Reeves paper, or Arches or uh, or Reeves paper. This kind of BFK, and don't I don't remember actually what BFK stands for. Does anyone? Don't either. Right. No. Um, no. Yeah, but it's just this beautiful cotton rag paper that you can do water media on and it holds it beautifully. It's, it feels a little bit more absorbent than a watercolor paper, but it doesn't but buckle or bow or anything. Um, right. It's incredible for charcoal, it's incredible for graphite. Uh, so if, if money's no object and you're gonna draw on something or just have a paper in your studio that's gonna be for your, your, your art that you're gonna sell, uh, the Reeves paper is, is probably my go-to. It does come, yeah. in, I think, it might may come in three ways. It may come in 240 as well, but I know it comes in uh, 140 and 300. Uh, the 300 is a is a pretty penny because um, uh, it is a a, a, um, uh, a printmaker's paper. Um, but it, it's I, I think the 140 is just fine, and that's the one that's kind of my go-to for for many things. Um, I think Mariana probably can talk a little bit more about Stonehenge and Arches printmaker's paper. Yeah. The Stonehenge, I have used a fair amount and I love it. it like, like the Arches uh, BFK, I, I find that it can even withstand some wet applications, like for example, graphite, water-soluble graphite. And I haven't tried watercolor pencil with heavy water, um, but I bet it would um, take e easily the beginnings of water, not, not soaking the whole paper, but uh, printers use it a lot. So, and the printing paper is often um, put in a bath of water to wake for it, and then, and then uh, a towel passed over it to, to drain the excess water so it can withstand that without losing its sizing. And that's the important thing when you wet the paper. To what extent is it sized so that it will still reflect your paint application without soaking the pigment and then making it a dull appearance. So that's the importance of the sizing and maintaining the sizing. Um, my learn is- later too, right? Say that again, I'm sorry. I said we have uh, slides on, or you have slides on sizing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes, I do. Do you know anything about oh, Mylar? You could go on. Um, no, Mylar, the new paper's coming out, and I have a little slide on on uh, some of these uh, coming up as well. So I'll defer to that. We can. Does anyone through. have any um, uh, favorite papers or at least some suggestions that we haven't covered in, the, in at least this slide? Good. Are you going to talk about watercolor papers later? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. This is just yeah, so fine. <laughs> jump in anytime yeah. as, you, as we go through because we're not perfect <laughs> at all yeah. by far. I wanted to have some, uh, some pictures. Um, and by the way, the middle one is the one I prefer, the heavyweight drawing. So when I make a supply list, I, I put that as my preference because it can withstand more, a little bit of wet media. And I have, and also it, the heavyweight drawing has done really well with the powdered graphite for me. So if we don't have the reefs or the Stonehenge that are, that have a better tooth, 
um, the heavyweight drawing has done very well um, in uh, with the graph powdered graphite and of course the wet media. So I prefer it, but it is a little more expensive than just the plain drawing paper, which you see on the right of it. Yeah, the one, the one thing about pad paper that I think everyone at some point has run into is you have a nice drawing and then you transport it and then the papers do kind of shift in transportation and they yeah. will kind of smear and rub. They them. rub. Um, yeah. I think if you have that really nice drawing and you're out of studio situation, look around the room and see if anyone has newsprint. And if you can tape the newsprint to the, the drawing so it's secured to the surface and not going to shift, uh, that will at least, especially with charcoal drawings where the powder is more sitting on the surface rather ingrained into the fibers, uh, I think that's yeah. a good habit. Um, and uh, of course, I have to do a plug for uh, experimental drawing uh, for that toned gray paper there, the nice green mm. there. Uh, toned paper is yes. fabulous. Yeah uh surface to work on if you haven't done uh, a lot of drawing on a gray surface uh, i think later in the fall kind of i think our last session of experimental drawing uh, we have an entire thing an entire four weeks on uh, just toned paper and drawing on toned paper and what that means uh, and it really is nice because you have to think about adding light and adding dark so if you're more familiar with just working on white paper your goal is really just to add line and to add shadow. If you're working on a black paper, your goal is to work on line and shadow. If you have a kind of a toned paper, you have to kind of think a little bit more, I don't wanna say three-dimensionally, but you have to think about lights, you have to think about grays, and you have to think about shadows. You're adding their lights, you're adding your shadows, and your gray is your kind of your middle ground. So it does change the way you think about drawing and seeing uh, the world a little bit. Yeah, good point. In terms of not smudging, by the way, for, for the, make a plug for recycling the um, the paper that uh, many crackers come in, like the inner paper of the box of crackers, for example, or even cereals is a wax type paper. And that also, I tend to, to open it up and sort of iron it out just with my hands and it can protect uh, either drawn or painted paper from each other, like the acrylic papers when it's warm will stick to each other. Like if you're doing collage, and you have painted and embellished some nice paper, sometimes they stick to each other if you leave them in your car in the summer. And so I tend to put that um, also just regular wax paper that comes in a roll and helps you to bake or whatever, and parchment paper also, those two work for protecting if you can't invest in glassine or newsprint handy. Um, so that's a good thing. This slide is really there just for FYI, not, not really all the applications, like the major applications of printmaking. And most of them, I have a slide, I think, on the weight of most printmaking papers. You want them to be supple enough to be able to kind of emboss some structure that you put through the printer, like a collagraph or a or a um, carved um, stamping, like a lino cut. Um, so you want you don't want a paper that's too too stiff, um, and uh, and at the same time you want it to be sturdy enough so that when it comes out of the printer you actually have a good um, good solidity and integrity. That's all I want to say about printmaking. If people are interested in printmaking papers, Liana Harbath, who has dedicated her art life to printing, is happy to do. Um, to do a session on printing papers with us. So let us know if that's an interest and we'll enroll her <laughs> and us into this. So I'm gonna talk about watercolor papers and I wanted to give you a sense of the weight, the surface structure um, or texture, the edges and colors and sizing, uh, not so much on color, but you can see the 90 pound. And after I just finished telling you that pounds is not, it's not very accurate. These are the, the uh, pictures I could find online because the US market is definitely wedded to pounds. Um, but I, I have a little bit of the conversion in the lower um, chart that you can see. But the 90 pound, you can see the edging to see how thick one is compared to the other. And also you can see a little bit of the, in the 300 pound, you can see the deckling of the eight, um, edge of say an artist paper or even Fabriano. Um, usually the deckling denotes, but not always that it's handmade rag paper. 
um, but it can be mimicked easily. And if you look at for the surface structure, you can see the wet application of hot pressed knot, which is also um, cold press in the American language, and the rough. And you can see how the uh, pigment, and I suspect this is uh, cobalt blue, um, which granulates. So you can see how the granules sort of sediment within the texture of the paper. And, um, and for the American market, well, no, not just American, but we use mostly the cold press, um, 140 pounds, which would be the middle paper. The 300 pound is extremely expensive, but as a as prior watercolors, I, can, I, I prefer that. So I had gotten um, used to buying 300 pounds <laughs> because I don't want to stretch it. And that's a whole other conversation about stretching paper or not stretching paper. What I have found my limited experience um, is that, I mean, limited in quotes, uh, is that um, when you stretch paper, it still buckles if it's not very strong. Um, so I don't know but, that it's worth the time and the effort to, to do the stretching. And that's part of the dilemma. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide, Jordan, for uh, one quick thing. I think you're going to find that that 90 pound mostly in, um, in pads of paper, like we just showed in prior yeah. where like Strathmore or any of those that you, you, you get a pad of paper, that says watercolor paper. That's, that's probably what you're going to find at that 90 pounds and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think I've actually seen 90 pound in anything, but a cold press. I don't think they have a lot of texture in general. Good point. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. I think it would be called something else, like vellum or mm -hmm. you know Bristol or something. It would be a not surface, like a, I'm sorry, a, a smooth surface, hot press type. Yeah. Then it wouldn't be called hot press. It wouldn't have those granule kind of like you see in the photograph. It would be a, a smoother vellum like. Paper. And I, I think a lot of the time you're going to um, um, find uh, 140 pound and 300 pound. If you have a dog, please mute your microphone. Um, uh, you're going to find that 140 pound and 300 pound uh, paper uh, yeah. in the more of a loose sheet. So you're going to buy single sheets of paper at a time. Uh, and um, it, that's it, that's largely where you're going to find it. I don't think, unless it's a watercolor block, you're going to be able to find pads of paper in the 140 pound. Although I, maybe I'm wrong on that one too. I no, just, there are, there are, but they may not be good. That's okay. the problem. They may not be very good. And, and I have bought a, a grouping, group, different groupings at different times. And they say 140, but they may not have enough sizing. They may not be well made. Yeah. Did you want to talk a little bit about uh, um, the watercolor blocks as a as an option as for purchasing? Yeah, actually, the watercolor blocks is kind of the easy way of not having to stretch paper and being able to paint in a way that it controls the buckling. And the reason is that it's cover, it's um, glued on almost almost all four sides, except for one section in the middle that allows you to put a, a knife or a painting knife in and then um, oh, thank you, Jordan. I don't have one handy. Thanks. Uh, and that's what how it looks. And it, it's 140 pound paper or 300 grams per meter square and, and that's an arches block and this is like where you have that little yeah. area not i don't know if you can you guys can see where it's not actually uh exposed to the the gluing around it and just slide it uh i use a palette knife because it's not too sharp or a fingernail yeah. and slide it around the edge to kind of when you're ready to remove the the piece and paint on the next one below it but these are just stacked papers that you do want yeah. to time but I, I think they're nice for travel, especially if you're going on yeah. vacation. Uh, they make a wide variety of sizes for them. Um, yeah. I, I honestly prefer loose overall, but I think that's a nice kind of. Yeah. It's not the loose. So yeah, travel it's great. Right. Yeah, there you can make your own. By the way, if you're good at cutting paper exactly right and putting glue around, there's plenty of YouTube videos that show you how to do that. Some better than others. Um, but you can make, for example, a small color block if you want to take it to travel. Um, and so that's a nice way. The other way to not have to, to uh, um, uh, stretch it is to um, wet the entire surface of the paper and to wet uh, and to work wet and wet. So that that takes a little practice to to um, 
sort of adjust to the wetness of the paper at different stages of your painting. It's actually hope it would take a like a course to learn it or something, but it's not hard um, after all. So paper sizing, I wanted to say a little bit about that. Um, the inter um, some papers are both internally sized and externally sized, and it's where you put gelatin is a major component of this sizing. And in fact, um, um, so, so internal sizing is putting the gelatin with the pulp uh, when you're making the paper, and the external sizing is when the sheets of paper are soaked in the gelatin bath, and it may be in addition to the internal sizing. So what is interesting to know is sizing really aids the paper in absorbing the moisture evenly and allowing the pigment to sit on the surface so that it refracts the color out to the viewer more, more brightly. Instead, instead of allowing the pigment as well as the water to soak into the paper, giving it a dull appearance. And that, for example, accounts for the difference in color that you see when watercolor dries. And we say watercolor dries about 20 to 30% lighter than you put it in. And at first, the wetness is what refracts the, the brilliance of the color to you. And when it dries, that, that refraction goes away. And then you say, oh my God, I thought I put it in much darker than this. So the watercolor is best to adjust to that. But that's the reason, the sizing. The next slide I think shows, um, oh, that you can restore sizing if you lose it. You can lose sizing because the paper is old and I don't know what the process of uh, breaking down the gelatin maybe over time and that's what happens. Or if you worked it already and you wanna rework previous surface. I'm putting a link to a video that, that I saw on someone using Holbein sizing liquid, which is out there, or, um, and then what, um, Daniel Smith's watercolor ground to, to kind of restore over a used paper. So different, different um, trends in, in uh, sizing paper. Gelatin was used initially, then aluminum sulfate was added to harden the gelatin. It's called alum and printers use it still, so they sell it in, in stores. But I wouldn't just buy it and put alum on. You have to know what you're doing. And then finally, um, in the 1850s, people started adding chalk to make to, to even out the pH and make it less acidic, which rose and alum combination was providing. But by the 60s, synthetic um, compounds like alkyl ketene dime or AKB is really doing what the gelatin and alum did and, and it's cheaper. So that's how it's commercially made nowadays with AKB. Uh, but you can still restore it with some homemade gelatin in, in some situations. What I have tried at the gelatin um, does is it prevents the, the, the pigment, especially watercolor pigment from spreading all over or ink, for example, uh, will stay in one place with the gelatin versus not, not with gelatin on a used paper. Um, it spreads uncontrollably. So you don't have a line if you put it in with a fountain pen, for example, or a small brush. So the next one I believe shows, um, oh, okay, I thought I had a slide on, on this sizing. Okay, no problem. Yeah, this, uh, so you can um, oil paper. Um, we, you certainly can now buy oil papers and why would you use them? Well, many people don't wanna carry canvases around, not even canvas boards, especially if they're traveling or they want to have the flexibility of cropping their scene. For example, plein air painters um, may want to capture a scene and they want to then cut off that tree that didn't work or whatever. And then so they can retrofit their, um, their work to a smaller um, way of displaying it either directly uh, framing it um, and varnishing the surface, which they now can well be done with oil papers, or you can prepare your, your own papers um, over 300 pounds, which would be about 140 pounds, uh, I'm sorry, 300 GSM, which is grams per square meter, um, which is an equivalent approximately of 140 pounds in what we're used to. 
uh, anything above that or in that can be prepared for oil painting for solvent based media. This opens the choice for what you can do with um, with your old paintings or um, or just the, the integrity of the paper is it has to have enough integrity to to take the watercolor ground or whatever surface or the gesso whichever size of the priming. Um, oh, thank you, sweetie. Uh, so the sizing and priming is what you want to concentrate on to pre to prepare any paper over three hundred GSM. Uh, for using for, for solvents or um, shellac or some other some other um, sort of biting medium. Um, the sizing prevents the oil to, from being absorbed into the paper and of course damaging the, um, the paper fibers and then breaking up over time. And priming is then the final layer of preparation that allows the, um, the pigment to sit in a nice way on top of the surface and, and its tooth. Um, there is a nice, very nice Jackson's Art um, uh, article on three ways to prepare surface for oil painting and it's really cool. But of course we have all seen in museums, uh, Picasso's and Brack's and Juan Gris's work on uh, cardboard that is still hanging out. <laughs> but I would say don't try it if you want to retrofit cardboard to oil painting, um, think about the sizing and priming. And you can certainly do it with current, uh, a current acrylic media, including an, an oil, oil um, based gesso. I'm complicating this, that there's most painters, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan and all, if um, that they're using acrylic gesso to um, prime, to, to yeah. prime the surface. And, uh, and then if you, want, if you want to use, for example, watercolor, um, you use a watercolor ground on top of that. Or, um, yeah, but it, the, oil, the oil gesso, oil-based gesso cannot be put directly on paper. So I believe Jackson's goes into that in the article and it says that you first have to sort of size it and put like a matte medium or a, some other um, barrier to the paper before you use the oil-based gesso. I would actually uh, advise from my experiences not, if you're gonna use paper for uh, oil ground, oil. I would not put, well, it's called oil ground, oil gesso. And yeah. oil ground actually dries harder than gesso does, like traditional gesso. So it takes about two weeks for oil ground to fully cure and dry so you can actually do painting on top of it. Um, and when it does dry, it dries a little bit more solid. So if you have a flexibility of a paper, um, I think that's actually a little bit more flexible than even a canvas. So I, I would stay away from it. Yeah. Um, my suggestion and my guide for people who want to paint oil on paper and don't want to spend the way too much money in the art store, if you ask me, uh, is if you have old watercolors, 140 pound, uh, I, I, in the past, I've just shellacked them. So the process for shellacking, and this is something I learned at, at MICA, um, that you just take 50% uh, mineral spirits and 50% shellac and just do two coats on top of an old watercolor that you just was a, a disaster or fail or whatever. Uh, let that dry and it has a, usually a kind of a gold patina to it if you do the amber shellac, there's amber and clear, um, which is a nice surface to work on. And you can crop it easily, you can cut it down. Uh, it's very transportable. It buckles a little bit, um, but for the most part, uh, it's a great surface to work on. Uh, you can gesso too if you want a white ground, but for the most part, you know, I think the shellac ground is probably cost effective and easy way to recycle bad paintings or, you know, scrap uh, watercolor paper uh, to become oil based. The one thing I would add and something to think about, though, um, is there's kind of an unwritten rule in art world where if you have, if you're thinking about, let's say you have a, a painting, oil painting beautifully done on paper, how do you present that to the world? Because typically, Mm -hmm. um, un unwritten rule is anything on paper has glass over it, but oil paintings generally do not. And don't ask me what I, I, I ended up putting glass on the ones that I've done just out of, I didn't know what else to do. 
And I still to this day have no idea how to present that aside from is actually taking your, your oil paper and mounting it on wood, uh, whether it be a panel or something along those lines. Otherwise you have to probably frame it under, under glass. So just something to think about if you are an oil painter and wanting to work on paper just for convenience or storage or whatever reason, uh, that one that really turned out well that you want to put into a show, you have to really think about how it's going to, how it's going to be presented. Because typically yeah. under glass, people are going to be like, oh, it's gouache because it's opaque and it's yeah. on paper. So if you want to avoid that, then you have to kind of devise um, kind of techniques to work around the idea of having to frame paper. Uh, so something to think about. Very good point. Yeah, can you? Either way is presentable, it sounds like, with oil on paper. Yeah. And mm -hmm. one thing, if you are intending to glue it to a backing board or to wood or to even to a, um, some people are doing it to um, uh, car, this uh, spongy cardboard, I'm blocking on the name of, uh, of um, the, the backing. Foam core. It's a foam cord, but it, yes, thank you. So some people are doing an archival foam uh, core. And the thing is to remember not to, um, some people protect the back of the paper from touching it with your hands full of oil paint or from the oil paint to go sl slip into the back of the paper. So the back of the paper remains receptive to acrylic glues or PVA glues. And so some people actually cover the back with a piece of freezer paper and tape it all around to make sure that they're um, the back, because otherwise any oil uh, remnant on the back of the paper will resist the glue because it's oil. So just that, and my pet peeve is that many um, masterworks nowadays in museums, which are done in oil are being presented under glass. Yes, it's museum glass, but I am, it's a big pet peeve of mine <laughs> that I go to a museum in another part of the world, pay all that money, and then you see the reflection on glass. <laughs> Do you know why, Jordan, or anybody uh, else? It's to protect it from activists who are throwing stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's the only reason I could come up with. Or, I mean, you get those, you know, like we talked a little bit already about paint on cardboard, like those two looser tracks. I mean, they have to be preserved in like a dark room, air temperature controlled, uh, because, and they don't even present them that often. They'll have them on rotation. So right. They're not exposed to people breathing uh, because it is such a, a, an unstable surface to work on. Uh, so they have armies of people just making sure they don't fall apart. Uh, so right. any kind of protection, I imagine the Mona Lisa is like that, that frame is probably, yes. number one, I know it's bulletproof, but it like, it, it, within the frame, it's probably air controlled and like temperature yeah. controlled. So it, uh, just to prevent the most valuable thing in the world for whatever reason uh, to be damaged in any situation. But. Right. But sometimes you're in the same room with something little under glass that is not as valued as something bigger that's not under glass. And you go, how come if this is protection, why isn't there they are all under glass, so I don't, I don't know. It's, it's puzzling to me. So this chart is actually helpful from the Jackson website. Um, it's just to, to show, and it's almost not readable. But the different kinds of oil paper, and there's one that they added that I have not seen. Maybe, maybe some of you have uh, experienced with is the Hannah Mule paper, which is actually made with bamboo fibers. So I talked before about the makings of paper and it's mostly wood pulp and rags and, and so on. But now more and more bamboo is being used. Uh, you've seen it for furniture, for cutting boards and it's because it's more sustainable. Uh, it grows easily. It, uh, it actually propagates way too easily <laughs> for some people's tastes. And it has very long fibers, which make it really sturdy. I'll never forget going to China in the 1980s and Hong Kong in particular and seeing these very high rise buildings, including 50 floors and more, all within a scaffolding of bamboo. And I could not believe your eye would get lost in the sky looking at how far the bamboo goes. And I could not believe that they were using bamboo, but I, I now believe it. So um, we kind of talked about this with Gesso. Um, you can even, uh, for watercolor 
paper retrofitting any watercolor paper there is a commercially made watercolor ground and uh, or you can make it yourself i've certainly made it sometimes using paper fibers added to the gesso or just adding some more marble dust to the gesso which normally it has you know that grittiness that you feel in the acrylic gesso is marble dust and uh, which is archival uh, but uh, other people are adding talcum powder out there or corn flour. I've seen that by some UK artists to thicken the paint. Um, and I don't know if corn flour is archival uh, or what the ending pH is. I, I keep wanting to stick with marble dust because you can buy that at the art store. Um, anyway. Yes. What, yes? what does that do? Does that give the paper texture? Is that yes, it gives more that? texture and absorbability of the paint. That's what you're aiming for in a, for example, in a watercolor preparation. Very good question. Yeah. Yeah, and normal gesso, it's it's what well, it's marble dust and gypsum, uh, which kind of yeah, gives that, white, uh, that white uh, kind of coloring. Um, they have a clear gesso out there too, which is more, I'd say, acrylic, like synthetic. There's no like marble dust really. And if you are using a clear gesso to kind of uh, go over, a, let's say you did a watercolor and you say, oh, well, let's do oil on top of it, which is something we do in class here. Um, it, it, you use that clear gesso over the entire watercolor and then you can actually paint oil on top of a watercolor, which is really mm -hmm. cool. But it's not going to feel the same as painting on a white gesso surface. But you, you also get the benefit of the watercolor showing through, although it is a, a little bit kind of um, not, it's a little cloudy. It's not the same kind of clarity, right. uh, but it's still a really kind of fun process to experiment with. Right, right. So we can move to the next slide unless there are questions on this. And this is what the bamboo paper, the Hannah Mule is the, I think it's a German brand or I'm not sure who makes it, uh, what, where it's made, but um, it's very cool to, to watch this progress. So their bamboo paper is 90% bamboo fiber and 10% cotton, which is a nice, nice combination, but I have not tried it. Has anyone? By chance, no, none of none of us. But it may be. I haven't even seen it for sale. I think you might have to order it online because I haven't seen it at Plaza. But it, I'm curious about it. All right, we can. Stop! Any Stop. Hey! <laughs> Sorry. Yes, Linda. Did you want to say? I think she's dealing with dogs. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so so the, I just wanted to mention a couple of really oddball papers that are, uh, I find really exciting. And, and some of you may have heard of it or even had experience with it already, but it's UPO paper, which is a synthetic inert and therefore archival paper, mostly for water media applications like watercolor and acrylic and gouache. I haven't seen any oil being painted on it, but I wouldn't put it past it that someone will try it or has tried it. So paint and water stay on the surface and only dry by evaporation, not by penetrating the paper. So that you, you have a board that forms when the paint dries kind of in your puddle of, because pud puddles of paint stay. And we, maybe we need to mute. Um. Hold on. Yeah, can you? Thank you. Um, so, um, so it's very, very smooth texture, like a vellum or like a Bristol paper. But what is nice is after you practice and you can do a little bit of dry and wet media applications, they're really lovely. And there's some um, YouTube videos, for example, if you look up um, you, uh, you paper ink applications, they're beautiful. A word of caution, there's these alcohol inks that are gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. I have some experience with them. The problem is they don't have pigment, they're just dyes. So alcohol and dye of different colors. So it is not a long lasting color. And I'm a little worried because a lot of artists are sort of jumping on the wagon of, of using alcohol inks because they really are beautiful colors, but they're evanescent, meaning they disappear. And I don't know in what period of time, but they're being sold as paintings. 
So just to caution you that uh, if you buy alcohol inks, just beware that they're not an archival, they're not a pigment, they're just dyes and they're gorgeous. They, they, um, they are beautiful on metal and on different kinds of metal, for example. And I don't know how, the, how long they last on metal, but it, they're not for paper or for canvas art, I would say, at least not archival. Tyvek paper is also synthetic. It's branded by DuPont and therefore it's very expensive because I think some other makers have not attempted it. It's what you see in um, covering houses that are being made for protection of their um, sort of insulation protection. Um, I'm sure you all have seen them. There are some other brands that are coming out there. I haven't tried them uh, and I don't know if there's I haven't tried to buy them, but I'm sure they're out there. And they're 100% polypropylene, which is a plastic, mostly for water media applications. I love Tyvek paper. It's a wonderful way of cutting stencils or uh, collage because it, these papers are indestructible. You cannot tear them. They're long fibers of synthetic uh, plastic basically, and um, they cannot be cut. They have to be cut with scissors uh, or, or knife. Um, in the, if you use Tyvek for watercolor and you put the watercolor against the light, you see, or, or if you just wet Tyvek paper, you can see the fibers crisscrossing. It's a beautiful look. And then you can do funny things with heat in Tyvek because it corrugates and it it becomes kind of a flower, which some people are using to make like pins and things like that. But basically there's many uses for Tyvek paper and I don't mind it at all for using it with watercolors. And I would imagine that you can even perhaps use oil on it because it's a little more texture than Yupo, but I'm not sure. So I'm not saying to do it, it would be experimental. There's a new pa uh, paper called Terra Slate paper which I don't know why it's called that, but it's also um, a synthetic plastic paper, um, but it's being marketed very much for printing. So there, it's like the two others above, but can also be used as um, feeding into your printer. By the way, all of them can be printed on with either a laser printer, uh, and they sometimes come, come in different thicknesses, both Yupo and Tyvek and even Terra Slate come in different weights, just like we, we say grams per meter square, um, and also pounds in that same reference uh, unit. And, and then there are a whole variety of permanent papers, which are mostly used for signage. In other words, signs, outdoor signs, so you don't care if they get wet with a rain, you know, but they still last. Um, and uh, for printing and particularly for libraries to um, create archival collections or to protect other priceless manuscripts. So stay tuned for this whole very exciting um, realm of synthetic papers that could be helpful for art as well. So if there's any interest, I just, I want to open it up to, to discussion and see if there's any uh, remaining interest in discussing some particular issue that we didn't have enough time for today. I'm happy to conduct it Tuesday at 6 p.m. and this would be the link, um, but it's up to you guys and let's open it up to discussion. I'm happy to do it. But yeah, not necessarily. Or, I mean, horror stories, whatever you want to talk about, it's fine. Or you say, that's good, I'm done. Was, uh, this, was this somewhat helpful? Uh, did you, and, and I'm happy, by the way, to post a link to my PCloud on Jordan's uh, website so that you can download the, the um, um, slide deck so to see some of the charts that can be helpful. Mary, the, the last slide that you showed and the special specialty papers, I think they were the last two and I don't remember the names. Yeah. But uh, where do you buy those? Do you have to yeah, Terra Slate is, you can buy it online. I haven't seen it in blocks or anything. Good, good question. And, uh, and the permanent papers, I just did a search for synthetic papers and all kinds. Of, I thought Terra Slate was the name for all 
permanent synthetic papers, but it turns out there's more people selling permanent papers, which are, when you look them up, they're all 100% polypropylene or some you know, some relative of that molecule. You know, for, uh, for a future event, um, it might be interesting to have a vendor come and demonstrate different kinds of paper with a sample pack that you could try yourself. Right, when, <laughs> that's, that would be great. And, and uh, it would be a question of finding the vendor. I think Tyvek is making way too much money. I mean, DuPont, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I may not be able to get them, but maybe the Yupo manufacturers or some, some other permanent paper manufacturer on, on the art um, spectrum, see if they would be willing to come to come talk to us. I think that's a great suggestion. I think, and I would be curious about it. Yeah, the more independent paper manufacturers are a little bit harder to uh, come by. I think a lot of the, the companies have been bought up over the years by coal art. And, uh, so I think they're being kind of more mass produced than they used to be. Um, I, I, for the life of me, I couldn't find some of the more independent paper uh, manufacturers. I knew there was one in Indiana that was doing great paper and uh, I couldn't find it the other day. I, thought maybe they either went out of business or were bought uh, but it's harder to find those kind of independent ones so getting like a yeah. distributor to come and talk about all the different types of paper I, I think we'd have to go after some of the larger companies to actually have them kind of show us the difference between all the papers and so forth uh, but we may be even a, a, as a Glen Echo Park entity maybe a little bit too small <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was insignificant in the, in the vast uh, scheme of how much money they make <laughs> so it might good. have to be one of us doing it. In other words, buying yeah. all the different papers and seeing that we could do. How, how it applies. That yeah. we could do. What about <laughs> plasma? You can't grow that big. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. Pl um, right. Plasma sell these different papers? Plaza sells UPO. And UPO comes in whole sheets. Um, and actually, Grace can tell us more about UPO. Do you want to say something? Uh, it does come in very large sheets. Then, like you said, you have to cut it with scissors or a knife. You cannot tear it. Yeah. It also comes in pads that are, um, I think, about I, 12 by whatever. Nine, I think. Nine by 12. Yeah, they're, they're small pad. pads. But it's uh, if you want to try it out, I suggest you get a, a little pad and see a what it gives. There yeah. are, I, I find it fascinating. I use it a lot. Yeah. So. The, um, the ink. Sorry, go ahead. The well, ink applications are wonderful on UPA too. I don't use uh, the you alcohol don't use, inks well, at all. You use acrylic inks, no? I use acrylic That's inks. I use yeah. soft acrylics. I use a tri tech inks. They're interesting. And uh, watercolor, if you, if you can. The thing is with watercolor, you put it down, you have to really leave it there, or else if you put something wet on top, you, it, it erases it. So it's, it's right. very tricky. <laughs> very, very tricky. Yeah, you have to use more creamy watercolors in that you do. sense. That's right? why the acrylics work better. Yeah, the acrylics really can well. have the surface dispersion that is more applicable to you, Paul. You're right. Right. Because they hold on better. Well, it's the... it's acrylic on acrylic, so that works better. Yeah, it's, a, it's plastic on plastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Penny. Um, I just wanted to comment. I... I've signed up for one or two of the Plaza online events where they send you samples of the paints or the paper. Oh, yeah. And I did one with uh, pastels, and they sent me a sampling of different papers oh. as well as sampling of some pastels. So that's sort of something like that that I had in mind, I guess. Okay. Yeah, may, maybe Plaza would like to do a piece. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. need to. Yeah. My question. Thank you guys so much for doing oh, this. this so You're so knowledgeable, both of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it got us to learn too. Yeah. yeah. It really is helpful when you guys give suggestions because it's, you know, we might not think about it and and it might be helpful to us <laughs> and you. Very so, I think, I think the, 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 the goal for most people, I think, is to find a paper that you really like for each medium that you work in. Uh, and then just stick with it for, until somebody else gives you a better option. 
Um, mm -hmm. For me, it's always been BFK paper, and then just I I've been happy with Arches watercolor paper for all that, and I'm I'm happy with the 140 pound. I'm I'm not very picky, uh, but those two papers, and then a, a, a tinted paper for pastel and for contact or anything like that, like a neutral gray, uh, black, or even a cream color. Um, but those, I mean, that's five types of paper at the most that I really work in, and that's about it. And are you able to get all of those at Plaza, Jordan? Yeah, or? absolutely. Yeah, the only thing that I think would be hard to find, uh, the sketchbooks that I use, I don't think I have any that are readily accessible. Uh, the sketchbooks I use, they stop making. Maybe I, I haven't seen them at Plaza in a while, but they, it's a really heavy weight paper. And even that, I mean, I use markers as a, as a sketching medium, and that even that paper, it, it pleats all the way through. So yeah. I still have yet found a the perfect paper to go out or i guess in the sketchbook format at least uh where the the ink or the alcohol based markers don't bleed all the way through that's still on my to find list the one last thing i actually didn't talk about is uh when you get a pad for a sketchbook or whatever uh think about the binding like how the papers are attached to one another i prefer a spiral just because it'll open up completely flat wow. versus when you get like the kind of the glue bound type sketchbooks where everything's glued onto the at, at the top kind of like the watercolor uh things we were showing you a minute ago those will split apart really easily yeah and i i much prefer being able to go completely flat and even though there's like the holes in the spiral which can be kind of annoying at times i think the ability where the paper won't fall out number one but also to work flat i think is much preferred uh personally right. so i always aim for a spiral bound um sketchbook and you can also throw a marker in the spot for, for transportation so I, I would i would suggest doing that yeah so i'll look into um inviting someone to to show mm -hmm. us different papers or if worse comes to worse you'll get it from us and, mm -hmm. and do a little tasting uh, among all of us any other questions comments Request. Yes. Thank you very much. It's very informative. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. So I'm going to post a link on, uh, I'll send Jordan a link in addition to the Colin uh, Campbell uh, YouTube, which I thought I had sent you, but I'm not sure. Okay. I have to look. Yeah, um, I, will, I will post a link so you can download the presentation. Just don't, you know, don't quote me. It's, I, I, I got, uh, it's for educational purposes. So I, I um, took sentencing from different places um, and it's purely for our edification. And it, there may be some things that are wrong or proven wrong later. Yeah, we'll try and so, post everything that happens, uh, at least in our meetings on that ACO page on uh, that's linked from my webpage. Uh, it also has like the schedule of events too coming up. So we have right. uh, Edrew Wazanski, uh, who's an incredible, I would call multidisciplinary artist after Chai Fen, and we have uh, Ada Rose uh, Bittenbaum from the Ada Rose Gallery uh, yes. in the Bethesda area about presenting about some of her favorite artists that she right. represents, and I think what it's like to run a gallery in the, the right. period, which uh, mm -hmm. she started in 2011, and she does a lot of art fairs and things, so I, I think kind of similar to Lenny, but yes. she actually has a physical space that she's still running. Uh, right. And, and, uh, there's one other person that Mariana was talking about. October, oh, no, uh, that's what I was going to say. October 15, we have Nancy Hirschbein, who is a collector and a, um, a, she started out as a docent at several of the Smithsonian museums, but is now a kind of a specific person at the Hirschhorn. And she is uh, extremely knowledgeable about that. And they basically let her, the Hirschhorn lets her put together uh, different topics for tours, uh, special tours. And she is very happy to number one, talk to us about how she collects, how she um, does her, her curator or teaching work at the Hirschhorn and other um, Smithsonian museums, and also to give us a private tour. Um, so we would schedule that at another time other than the ACO, but we want to invite her to talk to us at the ACO and then schedule a subsequent tour for anybody who wants to go. So that could be really fun. Yeah, so check out that uh, from my webpage. I think it's 
it's kind of a long one, so I don't want to tell you rattle off the ACO webpage, but if you just go to jjbruns.com, it's the tab on the left. It's, it's pretty easy to find, but everything's listed there. I've worked hard to organize that page so it looks presentable. <laughs> so Yeah, it, what we started out with little links here and there, and let us know also. We, we want to have a sort of community site there about <laughs> new exhibits or, or interesting articles like we started out. And so it's hard to know just how to organize them, but maybe we can do community links and, um, and have a section on that. So feel free to send us. And, uh, and I would want Grace uh, Peterson who joined us today also to tell us about how to start and run a cooperative gallery. Uh, she's, um, uh, she's with the um, uh, Bethesda Waverly. Gallery. I'm sorry. Gallery. Wait, yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and it's a wonderful gallery in Bethesda. And un unlike many other galleries in Bethesda, it has stayed open. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that is almost, almost 30 credit. years. Yeah, yeah, almost 30 years. And that's amazing. Yeah, because we're sad to have lost so many galleries. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. So, well, thank you, everyone, for taking the time. I know it's August and people are on vacation and so on. So the hard, hardcore, the hardcore. participants, God bless you. Thank you, everyone.